meta research is research on research. Uh, it's uh, about how to perform, how to communicate, how to verify, how to evaluate, and how to reward research. And, and that includes uh, many different aspects. It includes theory, uh, so some heavy math and, and statistics. Uh, it includes observation. It includes experiment. Uh, actually, it should include more experiment. There's less experiment happening <laughs> until now. Applications, obviously, some of them uh, very hot and very influential. For example, the entire funding system can be an application of, of meta research. And policy, uh, how, how do you use theory, observation, experiment, and applications to formulate policy about how research should be done, communicated, disseminated, and so forth. Um, you may want to take a look at that paper that uh, our core metrics uh, team published a couple of weeks ago in PLOS Biology. Uh, trying to put together what we know about that emerging field, its components, mm -hmm. and uh, why they they are important. So uh, much of what I'm going to present to you today is also to be found in that paper. So th this is the five areas, um, methods, reporting, reproducibility, evaluation, and incentives. And I'm just showing you uh, a number of specific interests that could be within each one of them. So uh, methods is about performing research. Uh, now, one might say, well, this is uh, methods of statistics, of course, there's heavy statistics here, but it's not from the perspective of uh, uh, here's another regression model that has a little bit of better performance compared to standard regression. Uh, it's, it's about how do you incorporate methods in the larger uh, scheme of millions of papers that are being done. So. Um, biases or, or questionable practices in performing uh, research, uh, methods to reduce some biases, to, to avoid some of the subjective or objective problems that appear in the process. Meta-analysis is you know, a meta-research meta tool. Uh, research synthesis in general, uh, meta-analysis has grown from uh, a one intervention at a time to network meta-analysis and meta-meta analysis and meta-meta-meta-meta uh, whatever analysis. Um, how do you integrate evidence across different types of studies and, uh, and empirical insights? Cross-design synthesis, collaborative team science, consortia, how, how do you build those? Not necessarily focused on the specific focused question that each one of these teams or consortia would have, but, but how do they function best? How are they going to answer not just one question, but multiple questions in the most efficient way? And research integrity and ethics. Uh, reporting. Uh, again, a number of items here, uh, biases and questionable practice in reporting or explaining or disseminating and popularizing research, anywhere from the scientific sphere all the way to how the community perceives research and research products and, and how often we and uh, overall community uh, and common people get misled when they hear about science, even though science should be the one thing that should be enlightening in, in, in our lives. Conflicts of interest, uh, how do you disclose them? How do you get rid of them? How do you minimize their impact? Um, practices like registration, registration of studies and other bias preventive measures, do they work? For what type of studies? How well are they applied? Can they be applied better? Methods to monitor and reduce such issues. Obstacles to sharing data and methods are, are a key problem for reproducibility. And there's other issues involved here. How much replication we need to do? Who's going to do it? Uh, do we need to have reproducibility checks for what type of studies, when, again, who and how and, and where are they going to be funded? What is the effectiveness or the correction and self-correction of the literature? How quickly do we uh, refute results that are not accurate and replace them with more accurate ones? Then evaluation. That, that's a very hot uh, set of uh, uh, disciplines on, on its own. So effectiveness, cost, and benefits of all uh, new uh, approaches to peer review, to um, uh, other uh, science assessment methods, uh, uh, who is reviewing what, when, uh, pre-publication, during the protocol stage, post-publication, during publication, all of that, uh, how much of that can be done, how much of that is efficient, how much of that works or does not work. And finally, incentives. It's unlikely that we can change anything unless people are incentivized to do the right thing. So how do you reward good practices? How do you perhaps penalize some of these flaws? At the same time, you need to strike the right balance. Uh, how do you value research? How do you value individuals to get promoted, uh, get appointed, to have a career, to have a life? 
Um, how do you assess institutions? How do you assess entire systems of, of how they're contributing to research? So it's a huge agenda. And uh, for a long time, I have been pushing for that meta name, uh, even though there has been a lot of uh, dissent about what is the best name for that field. Um, why a new meta name? So th this is a, an illuminated manuscript from 1496. Uh, it's Aristotle con metata physica. Uh, so this is metaphysics. And, and why metaphysics? Well, be because uh, the, the person who found that manuscript at, at some point, that was not a separate uh, book, but it was attached at the end of another book, which was physics, physica. And, and there was no title, uh, but they had to find a title. So it said, well, it's the book right after physics. And this became metaphysics. So in our case, uh, this is research that seemingly comes after research. But I would also say it also comes before research. So meta research until now, most of what we have done is that we wait for this research to be done. And then there's some evil people like me who say, oh, this is all wrong. Uh, and uh, then it's too late to correct. So I, I think that the ability to look at the broad picture once you have a lot of data is nice. But it would be even better, and this is what we want to promote, to think proactively and preemptively about how to fix these problems before they appear. Now, the fact that we have a, uh, an inventory of problems is a good starting point to try to work on them, but it, I think that preemptive thinking would be the best. Is that a new discipline? Well, like any scientific discipline, there's many others that are neighboring, and this is just a, a list of other disciplines like history and philosophy of science, uh, psychology and sociology of science, statistics, data science, informatics, uh, evidence-based medicine or evidence-based X, research synthesis methods, meta-analysis, journalology, David Moher likes that, that term, centometrics, bibliometrics, organizational operations research, ethics research, integrity and accountability research, communication sciences, policy research, behavioral economics. All of those are very well-established disciplines. All of those could contribute, could feed into meta-research. We could use techniques, methods, technologies, ideas from these disciplines, and we can also give back techniques, methods, ideas to each and uh, every of these disciplines. But it's different from all of those. How much of that research is done? So for a while, we have been trying to piece together the literature on meta-research that is already existing. And apparently, there's about 10,000 papers or probably more on meta research that have been published to date. Uh, this is uh, an exercise that uh, uh, Dan uh, Fanelli from our team led and tried trying to map these papers. Uh, this is just papers published in the five first months of 2015, and you can find them in our website along with many other uh, papers from earlier years, about 800 papers, so quite a very active field. I'm not counting here uh, specific applications, so it, it, a new statistical method will not be included here. A new meta-analysis about some drug or, or set of drugs or, or a network will not be included here. If it's a, a broader question about how our statistical methods is used uh, across a whole field, that would be in here. If it's about how network meta-analysis are done, misdone, misapplied, applied, that would be here. But it would not be specific single applications. If we were to do that, obviously, it would be probably millions of papers. This is uh, a number of initiatives that are in, in the borderland of metrics. Uh, again, you can find those in the PLOS Biology paper and also in, in our website. And uh, Steve is going to uh, describe our website in, in more detail. But there are groups already out there who are working on different aspects of, of that vast territory. So uh, lots of people are interested in, met in methods, the Parkin collaboration, the Campbell collaboration uh, in biomedical science and social science, respectively. They have a tradition of having strong methodology groups about how to review and integrate evidence. Uh, Ian Chalmers uh, has the James Lind Library about the evolution of treatment assessments. Uh, the Society for Clinical Trials has uh, a very strong interest on, on randomized trials and clinical trials in general and their applications. Uh, the research, uh, the um, Society for Research Synthesis Methodology, again, a set of methodologies working on methods for systematic reviews and meta analysis. Biosharing in the biological sciences, the Human Proteome Project, I list here as an example of one field that is trying to put some standards on how research in their field should be done. 
Um, and uh, there's many other fields in omics that are trying to do the same and, uh, and CPRE on research ethics. Then reporting, there's many efforts in the field uh, that are ongoing, uh, starting with clinical trials gov, that is uh, the, the first uh, large scale registry that includes uh, clinical trials. There's about 13 registries and possibly more that I'm not aware of currently. There's a lot of debate about what to register and when. Uh, the Equator Network has included about 200 uh, reporting guidelines for different types of uh, designs across biomedicine that are variously applied and variously adhered to or not adhered to. Uh, sense about science becomes a little bit more uh, end product communication with the community. So how would the community understand science or misunderstand science and uh, avoid having all these uh, uh, creationism and uh, denialism, uh, you know, stupidities that uh, affect, uh, unfortunately, uh, scientific work and its credibility. And health uh, new reviews, um, again, uh, the end product of how research is communicated and what, what people will understand from the research that is being communicated in the news. Is, is that proper, appropriate, balanced, or are there problems with it? Reproducibility, there's a large number of reproducibility efforts nowadays, and most of them have started in the last few years. Uh, so there's the Center for Open Science that has launched uh, large-scale reproducibility projects, and I'll talk about one of them probably briefly. Uh, the Berkeley uh, in uh, Initiative for Transparency in the Social Sciences is also interested in promoting transparency and reproducibility in sociology, economics, and political science. Uh, BPS is a group that uh, is part of metrics or affiliated with metrics, and it's here on, on campus. Uh, John. Uh, Crossnick is leading that, uh, again, focused on um, social sciences and best practices, the political science replication, Yoda, uh, launched by Harlan Kuhnhoggs uh, at Yale, about sharing of raw data and making raw data available from clinical trials and clinical research. Neurovolt, uh, another effort that is uh, uh, here uh, on campus, uh, I have several colleagues in the neurosciences and psychologies, is uh, Russ and Brian Hill? No? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, open fMRI along the same lines, a repository for data for uh, fMRI. Lots of NIH repositories, some of them have been very successful over a number of years, starting with dbGaP and GEO and, and Science of Change uh, and so forth. Uh, evaluation of science, again, uh, there's many initiatives. Some of them have been up and running for a long time. The Peer Review Congress has been uh, launched, I think, in 18, not in 18, although Drum and Rennie is. Uh, figure who is kind of an eternity uh, father of, of, the, of the field, but 1989. Um, and it's done every four years, and it's reviewing evidence on peer review practices. The Center for Scientific Integrity, PubMed Commons, the new platform for post-publication review, archive, very prestigious in the physical sciences, a way to disseminate research before formally publishing it so that people could see it and comment on it and improve it. Um, ICMG, uh, standards for publication that many, most, all journals should uh, adopt, cope for publication ethics, pub, peer, peer, and so forth. And finally, lots of efforts to improve incentive structures, starting with reward. There was a major meeting, the, the first reward equator meeting in, in Edinburgh about a month ago, and um, uh, then AAAS has a lot of interest in promoting uh, that new revolution uh, of how science is done and, and make it more transparent align incentives, and finally, other policy institutes. And then it's us, you. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that what we want to do is become a connector hub for many of, of these initiatives. Uh, most of these initiatives don't really know that others are happening. And there's probably many that even we do know that, that they're happening, but the, the whole field is, is really blossoming. So I will spend a few more minutes, uh, and then Steve will uh, take over uh, on a couple of meta research things to, to give you some examples of, uh, of what's happening at the moment. Um, the, the, the common denominator is that across very different sciences, from astrophysics to economics to biology to entomology and medicine, there are some similar challenges. Not the same, but often they're pretty similar. So data sharing from telescopes and, and from medicine is not really very different. Uh, blinding of experiments. Um, Rob McCune, who's an affiliate of our center, published a paper in Nature a couple of weeks ago, along with uh, Saul Permuter, a physicist, a Nobel Prize physicist, 
focused on blinding of, of data so that people would not be affected on how they read it. And it's something that can apply from psychology to physics, to high energy physics, to cosmology and, and medicine. So currently the, the scientific environment is mostly oriented towards trying to get significant results. And we've, we've documented that again and again. And, and design, uh, to most people's mind, means that uh, I want you to do something so that I can get a significant result. No matter what, just do me that favor. That's what I want to get. Um, recently, we looked at the entire PubMed. We found uh, in the last 10 years, uh, 1.6 million papers with abstracts that had p-values, and about 96, 97% of them had statistically significant results. Uh, this is how it looks like. We also looked at uh, uh, over 800,000 full text articles, uh, and uh, whenever they had p-values, again, 96% of them had significant results. Now, significant results are becoming a little less common. As you might see, this is the, the red line in the first plot. Um, so from 98%, we're dropping to 95%. So there's a little bit of room for some negative results out there, but not that much. So how do we realign uh, and reinvent that system? How do people get significant results? Well, one might think that they do that mostly with running very big studies. And, and increasingly, we may see that because we have big data, and if you have big data, I mean, you can get P-values of 10 to the minus 100 very easily. But until now, people get significant results with very small studies. So uh, this is a, an empirical evaluation where we had people from uh, many different teams working on neuroscience trying to look at the empirical evidence of neuroscience. And from clinical trials all the way to animal experiments and for clinical research and bench research, the common denominator was extremely underpowered studies. On average, 20% power and sometimes power of 8%. So extremely underpowered science means that if you get a significant result, yes, um, that looks nice, but it's very likely to be a false positive for, for reasons that it would take a long time to explain, let alone the fact that obviously there was, be, it was going to be a lot of false negatives just as well. Uh, this is uh, another effort happening in, in economics, and um, uh, there's as I showed you, a few initiatives in economics, uh, there, there's a couple that I didn't put in there, like the Meta-Analysis in Economics Research Group that uh, is uh, hosting international meetings and trying to, to look at economics as, as meta-research. As part of, of that initiative, this is uh, that project that uh, will be coming out in the Economics Journal, more than 70,000 effect estimates in economics uh, on 130 topics. The common denominator, almost all of these studies are, are grossly underpowered. Uh, very few studies have good power. <laughs> Replication is something that has not been widely used in most fields, but some fields have taken that step. Uh, human genome epidemiology is, I think, the classic example. You cannot really publish anything unless it is extensively replicated in multiple studies. But most teams have not really wanted to have that. They thought that it, it would be me too research. We're wasting efforts. We're wasting resources. Whenever I, I talk about reproducibility, the question always arises, well, that will cost a lot. We need to move forward. But we need to move forward, but we also need to go back because when people do go back, like for, for clinical research, this is a paper by Glenn Begley uh, in Nature showing that the reproducibility rate in preclinical research for drug targets is only 11%. And other studies have found reproducibility rates of 10 to 25% in that field, which may explain why much of that highly cited uh, research that proposes new drugs actually is not reproducible and eventually does not lead to as many successful translations as we would hope. There's um, many reproducibility issues across very different fields that have been launched. Uh, a couple of months ago, I wrote that review with Glenn Begley and just listing a number of fields where reproducibility concerns have been raised. Microarray data, stroke animal studies, journal biology, oncology, genome sequencing, in vivo mouse studies, neurological studies, mouse models, genomic cell line analysis, commercial antibodies, commercial allies, and the way that journals handle scientific information. Uh, most of these people don't really communicate with each other, but they all kind of describe very similar problems. And, and this is a number of fields where these problems have been described. Neuroscience, pharmacology, uh, genomics, bioinformatics, stem cell biology, oncology in vitro testing, chemistry-led discovery, computational biology, pathology, biomarkers, organizational psychology, and observational research. Again, fields that don't necessarily communicate, but they're facing very similar efforts. Uh, a couple of years ago, I tried to put together evidence on the psychological sciences on how 
often replication is done and how often is it likely to see reproducible results. So we had a number of empirical estimates and uh, this is piecing them together that uh, having true discovery and that being replicated is a very uncommon scenario in that field, at least until a couple of years ago, less than 1%. Self-correcting, you got it wrong, but then the replication got it corrected, less than 1%. False non-replication, probably even less than 1%. Perpetuated fallacy, wrong initially, and then wrong in the replication, about 2%. 43% unconfirmed genuine discovery, so someone found something that nobody wanted to waste money or effort to try to replicate it and 53% on challenge fallacy. And about two months ago, we had the results uh, led from the Open Science Collaboration of the Center for Open Science, which is uh, a brother organization uh, led by uh, uh, Brian Nosek with 100 high profile psychology experiments where independent scientists in collaboration with the original authors tried to reproduce the original results. And, and this is what they got. This is the p-values and the effect sizes in the original studies versus the replication. The interpretation of these results have, have really led to a huge debate, ranging from psychology is not a science, uh, all the way to everything is perfect. And obviously, I don't believe uh, that psychology is not a science, and I don't believe that everything is perfect. Probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. But at least the scientific community and also the general public have started to take notice that this is a serious issue that needs to be tackled seriously. And then the question is, who is going to do that? Who is going to pay for replication? Who is going to take the lead? Is it going to be the same investigators? Is it going to be different investigators? Is it going to be opponents like entire replication? Maybe sometimes it could be the, the whole public if you have mathematical uh, calculations that you can split into tens of thousands of computers that they can crunch numbers and then try to see what they find. All of these are open questions. Let me run through that. Um, this is some work that uh, we did uh, with uh, uh, Shanil Ebrahim, who, who was a fellow with, uh, with Metrics, uh, looking at reanalysis of clinical trials. So this is not replication in terms of doing yet another study, but um, it is um, reanalyzing the same data for the same outcome, and this is clinical trials. So seemingly it should be the end product, maybe the most trustworthy and most rigorous type of research. Nevertheless, we found that 35% of these reanalyses uh, had concluded that the the final word, whether patients should be treated or not, or who are the patients to be treated, was different in the reanalysis versus the original paper. Most of the time, the original authors were involved in the reanalysis. So maybe what we saw here is mostly that for these reanalysis to be published in the current literature, you need to have um, something to say that is different. People are not willing to accept that I did a reanalysis uh, and you found the same results, so why should we publish that? So, so we need to find ways that people who do spend a lot of time, and a reanalysis can take a lot of time, a replication can take even longer, they do get rewarded for what they do, and they do get recognition. So reproducibility checks are done currently in a number of fields, ranging from prostate cancer translational research to cell biology, cancer biology, and psychological science, and there's other plans to do them in economics. There's some plans that I've heard about in chemistry. Um, some of them actually are already happening. And the difference is that these reproducibility checks currently attract a lot of attention. Well, a reanalysis in the past would have been very difficult to publish. Now, science and nature and major journals are very interested to see that done. And they even try to, to seek the publication ahead of time and make sure that it will come their way. Finally, a reward system. I think this is something that we need, really need to work on. Um, about a year ago, along with Moen Puri, we proposed a, uh, a reward system that runs like an electrocardiogram, a PQRST, uh, or productivity, quality, reproducibility, sharing, and translation. Until now, probably we're paying attention to productivity, which I have no problem with. Productivity is great, but you need to put it into perspective and see how one could buttress the other components, how one could measure these other components, and how could one reward the right application of, of these other components. And um, this is one example that I, I like to use, uh, which is maybe a little funny, maybe a little serious, but th this is like an exchange market uh, or, or stock exchange or, or uh, foreign currency uh, exchange. Um, this is how much different things are worth. A publication is worth one point. Um, doesn't matter whether it's translated, refuted, or, um, uh, or, or, or whatever happens with it. Just publish a nice paper. That's very good. 
Uh, sharing doesn't count. Teaching doesn't count. Um, peer review doesn't count. If you get grants, that counts. You can trade an R01 for five nice papers, or uh, depending on, on what the field is. Uh, then you can buy other wealth items with uh, three nature papers uh, or three very nice papers. You can become an assistant professor with 10 of them. You become an associate professor with 20 of them. You become full professor. Uh, if you have one doctoral student, you can uh, uh, trade him as a slave uh, for two papers uh, because you expect to get two papers out of him. I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> he knows that already. <laughs> Sorry, Josh. No, I mean, obviously not. And John. <laughs> um, and uh, if you have power, I mean, if, if you're the president or the dean, then you can get 200 points and we don't have to explain how you're going to use them. Uh, so the the changes to that system are many and, and one has to think about how to do that. One option is to give value to replicated publications, even more to translated research and maybe even subtract points for refuted research, give value for training of people in doing good research and sharing and reproducibility efforts. Um, and maybe even be more disruptive, like in the last column, the change two, uh, which means that uh, we are all researchers, titles have no value. If you get grants, you lose points because you got all that money, you better do something with that. Uh, and if you have power, again, you lose points because you have that much power and you can control so many people, you better use it wisely. Now, I I'm not saying that this is where we need to go because if we do that, nobody will want to get a grant. Nobody will want to become a professor. Nobody will want to get any power or anything. But we need to think about what changes are desirable and what changes are going to do uh, good to the system versus not. And in order to do that, we need to take into account not just us, but whoever else is working in research or is interested in research. So besides scientists, there's the industry, sales, marketing, R&D, universities, private investors, public funders. Some of them open, others close, like the military. Uh, journal editors, for profit publishers, professional scientific societies. Uh, what else do I have here? Uh, staff, hospitals, insurance companies, government, state, federal authorities, consumers of products, common people. They have very different agendas. Some people want to publish, others want to get funded. Some people want to get um, translated research and something that works, and others just want to make profit out of it. So if we want to make progress, we need to get all of these to uh, have a coordinated plan and eventually work together and, and get it better. So there's a lot of that stuff happening. There's a lot of meta research already out there. We're trying to map that research and create a connector hub. Most meta researchers are still working within their little niche. And most of the time they're just trying to piggyback their research within some other agenda. So they say, I do research on diabetes. And by the way, I'm going to spend a little bit of time to do a, a little meta research project. So we, we want to bring that to the light, to the forefront. Many of the challenges across fields are potentially very similar, and we have to see how similar they are, and also see what differences there are, because this could be also material. And how are we going to do that? We need more meta research. We need more of you to be interested in this. We need you to attend our conference in a couple of weeks <laughs> here at Stanford. If you haven't registered yet, please do. The there's a number of seats remaining, I believe, in the stadium, or uh, <laughs> uh, not the stadium, but still. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think I'll stop here, which took probably even longer than that. We'll give it a Probably the least ten minutes for general conversation. Okay, then I'll just go. So uh, my, uh, I'm actually going to use this. this uh, okay, let's see if this works. Is there something will collapse. Anything. Uh, so, um, my goal here is to just talk a little bit about the, the organization metrics and, and what we're doing and what we're hoping to do. And uh, one of the things we're hoping to do is get as many of you involved as, as can be. Um, so, a lot of our values are imprinted in our website. And uh, I have to give a huge amount of credit to Debbie Dunn in the back and Stacy and Nelly and, of course, Dan uh, for uh, building this over the past three months. We just launched it within the last... <coughs> roughly a month and still in formation, uh, but uh, has a tremendous amount of information in it already. 
and I'm just going to sort of walk through the structure uh, so you can see how much is here and uh, and maybe make suggestions about how uh, what else we can add that would be useful to you and uh, how you might want to contribute to it because we really want it to be a platform for folks. Uh, like we would get first priority here at Stanford, um, but really across this whole uh, domain that, that John has talked about, which is you know spectacularly large and 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 multifaceted. So here we have a you know why meta research matters. Um, we have news, we have events, um, we have links on the homepage to a lot of um, uh, um, varied uh, material, and then I'll just show you what we have. Let me just uh, look into resources first. Under resources, you see we have uh, publications, and this is the publications database that that John uh, talked about. It's we have a search capability right now. It's not a hundred percent functional, but uh, we still we have what you will see is you'll be able to search through this database, which we're constantly searching for meta research articles. You can search in area of study across these various fields and the region of the world, publication year, and also publication type and and keywords. So right now you'll see below we have already some. Uh, 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 research featured. Most of this is, some of this is by uh, the uh, metrics affiliates and others is just information of direct relevance to the uh, research community. And this is to help all of us keep up with what's going on because it's coming out so fast that I know that I can't uh, keep up with it without without this sort of help. So we're, we're, we're having regular searches and we're going to uh, feature the stuff that we think is um, most interesting. But be behind this will be everything that we find. The Research Digest is a list of articles that we think are of particular interest, not just to scientists, but to but the external community. And you'll see here, uh, we featured uh, uh, high, high profile uh, articles under methods, with some other articles under reporting, um, under evaluation, reproducibility, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, Debbie, if you want it jump in at any moment to either correct or ah uh, yeah let me go back to the home yeah so if we uh, actually click on this you'll see the map that uh, John showed it's a little bit slow uh, of uh, publications in, in different uh, sites and we're going to try to keep this updated as well this link I didn't actually, yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, and this breaks down into all the fields. Let's see if I click on this. I didn't actually go. Wow. Okay, so these are the publications just on, uh, I guess it was evaluation. You can see going through here, and we have uh, the links to each one. Now, some of them are behind firewalls. So if you're not at, at, you know within the university community, you may or may not be able to have access to them. Let me go to other resources, uh, events. Uh, this is events going on in many of the domains that uh, John has talked about. Of course, we put our event right up here, um, but here's a lot of uh, meetings that are happening uh, across many of these uh, uh, domains that we've talked about. Related Sites has um, uh, the, uh, the links to many of the groups that John mentioned. Um, and we also have um, Blog, um, which is also listed under News. Uh, and we have um, a, a few entries here, and we're going to be inviting members, particularly around here, to be able to post uh, blog posts. Yes. So in terms of who's involved, uh, we have you know, our team it says filter by role. So here's the leadership and here's pictures of people you were sitting right here. But affiliated faculty, this gives uh, many of the people around the room, Russ Altman, Despina, Mark, Sean, Dave Donahoe, statistics, Hank Greeley, who's law, genetics, John Krosnick, who's psychology and political science, Bill Lavori, statistics, Robin Kuhn, law, Laura, who's here, right, uh, statistics. Uh, we particularly like the breadth of schools and disciplines that are represented. Dave Magnus is a bioethicist. Neil Mahotra is in the business school. Michelle, the law school. Mark Musen, bioinformatics, um, um, uh, medical informatics. 
um, Ingram statistics, Doug Owens policy, and uh, Russ Poldrack. I'm going to actually uh, click on his uh, site in a minute. Uh, Londa and Robert uh, Proctor are both historians of science. And we have Randy Stafford, Nets PRC, and I'll go to the last. And the last one is um, Bob Kipcharani, Brian Wandel, and neuroscience and Toronto. Yeah. So that gives you a sense of the our initial affiliated faculty. We would love to get more um, more who are actively engaged in this area, and each one of these has uh, relevant links. Um, we also have news, oh, um, which is uh, uh, the coverage of meta research uh, topics in the sort of general news literature, but also in the science news literature. So this is these are general pieces, not as much the um, uh, the technical pieces as before. Our partners are organizations that uh, are doing this sort of thing. If any of you have not looked at healthnewsreview.org, I would I would uh, tell you to go click on it. It's a huge amount of fun, uh, but also very 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 serious. It's it's an organization um, that's funded by the same funders that uh, we have, and they look at the prominent uh, scientific articles that have gotten press, and they. Yeah, and they, you will see they give a five stars. It's actually a brilliantly engineered and very, very carefully done site. This is not to the article, but to the coverage. And does the coverage adequately convey the strengths and weaknesses of the underlying literature? And what I like about them is they're both constructive and critical. They, they give very strong uh, rewards uh, in terms of kudos and, and lessons for others in, for the articles that are well covered and 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 where they have talked to all the right experts, and then they will see our review summary, and you see ratings, and they have a very structured why this matters. Here are the criteria. Does the news release adequately discuss the cost of the intervention? Not satisfactory. Does the news release adequately quantify the benefits? Does the news release adequately explain, quantify the harms? Does the news release seem to grasp the quality of the evidence? Does it commit disease mongering? Does it identify funding sources and disclose COI? Does it compare new approach with existing alternatives? Does it establish availability of treatment test product, uh, the availability, the true novelty? Um, and does it include unjustifiable sensational language and, and, and include quotes, of, including quotes of researchers? So it's really, and they apply these to every single article. So uh, Gary, who, who runs this site, will be one of the speakers at the Netflix conference in two weeks. So this is just one example among many, the Equator website that uh, John mentioned, incredibly, similarly incredibly rich in its own way. So there's a huge community out there of folks who mainly are talking to themselves and their own communities. And more and more with some high publicity stuff happening, there's crosstalk among those communities, but not that much. So um, what we're trying to do in this website is put it all together so we can see across the landscape all the things that everybody's doing, including people here, to make science science better. Um, I think I'll just want to look at one or two other uh, parts of the site, and then I'll just throw it open for your comments. Um, let's see what else. Oh, uh, external affiliates. Is that here? Yes. So these are uh, scientists we've identified across the country and across the world. Takes a second. Yes. Um, Ian Chalmers founded the, the Cochrane Collaboration. Peter Doshi. A lot of stuff on Tamiflu. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but uh, Bendel Goldacre, some of you may have heard of. But just click on these uh, folks. Each one is there for a reason, and they're all doing really, really fascinating work. It's really uh, quite exciting. So I think I'm going to actually stop there, unless Debbie, is there something particular here that you think I should feature or, or mention before I. Yes, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. So I'm gonna I'm going to click on reproducibility, and again, this is still very much in development, maturing. But what you'll see here, besides uh, our our pictures, and could have, is we have the two centers that are affiliated here at Stanford. One is Russ Paldrack Center, so you can click on that, the Center for Reproducible Neuroscience, and you will see that come up. Actually, there comes up there. It's a very nice um, website, and they're doing a lot of very exciting stuff. And similarly for the Center for uh, uh, John Krosnick's group, 
on uh, best practices in science, mainly focusing on uh, social science. Um, what's interesting about the whole meta research field is that the problems, as John said, there's uh, very, very, the, the texture of it across the whole scientific landscape is really fascinating because different fields have sort of a different constellation of problems. They all have sort of this, the, the array of possible problems is, is the same, but each one has a sort of different fingerprint for exactly, you know, some, some groups, you know, data sharing is the norm, replication, you know, very poor, or um, they use clearly ridiculous methods. Um, and each one is in different stages of reformation. Um, some are way, way, way behind in the area of clinical research. We have 30 or 40 years of slow reform efforts that are, that are happening. In psychology, I feel like a, a bomb has gone off just in the past few years. Um, so anyway, I'm going to leave it there and just get your thoughts on anything we could or should be doing um, here that would help you uh, or thoughts you have about other things we should be doing either around campus uh, or, or in the world. So I'm, I'm just going to stop there and, and uh, hand it off to you if you have any either comments or suggestions. Yeah, Laura. Right. Avoided all the active slide shows and things moving on the page and focusing on information, not on the visual activity. Okay, good. Good, that's that. Um, other things that we should have here or present in a different way? Any initiatives you know about that you may want to make sure we know about? Into the silent group, yes. Yeah. Well, this has a lot to do with the you know, the needs of the press. I mean, we're very, very different communities. Um, so hopefully Gary will, you know, we'll have an opportunity to talk about that at the conference. But let me say a word about the conference and I'm hoping as many of you can come as possible. It's a very different kind of conference, we think, um, because it's very, gonna be very, very focused on uh, proposals for solutions or actionable uh, acti you know, things that we can do. So every speaker, there's there's no session where the speakers are going to be talking more than half the time, and every speaker who's only going to speak for ten minutes has been asked to provide basically either the entire presentation or the final uh, section of their presentation be devoted to proposals for what we should do, and then those proposals will be taken into group workout. Uh, it, it will be discussed in, in plenary. They'll be taken into breakout groups, or they'll be augmented, refined, and then they'll be put up on posters. Everybody will get to vote on what they think are the best ones. And then we will rediscuss the highest profile proposals the next day and hopefully uh, create collaborative working groups um, internally and externally uh, to pursue what we think are the, the, the areas that um, you know are, are, have the, potentially the highest yield. So it's, we're going to sort of assume, we've told every speaker, assume that folks understand that there's a problem that we need to start doing something about it and sort of start in the middle of the story, not spend the whole time as we often do presenting what the problem is and then, oh, we can't get time to you know, figure out what to do about it. So the, really the entire conference is gonna be focused on what we should do. And that could be research projects, it could be policy uh, implementation or policy test. Um, it could be a whole range of things, but again, focusing on, on what we should do and not just what we should think about. So. Every per we've allowed enough space so every every person who's there will make a difference. So a little bit like the PHS conference you just had, which I thought was also yeah. brilliantly designed to, to get to get the input of everybody there. So um, so again, I hope as many of you can come as possible, Laura. Sure. Really helpful. Yes. Yeah. That's very so.
first of all, there's a whole uh, piece of this. Oh, actually, one piece that you don't see here is a, a sort of a live or almost live uh, feed from files.gov. So that page is not quite up and running, but you will see it. Um, we've also started talking about a peer, uh, a, a broader peer network. Now, exactly what you're talking about, which is sort of serving the general community, that's going to be very tricky. Um, you know, we, we can't necessarily be all things to all people, um, but but keep bringing that up, and we're going to try to figure out what we can do there. But it, it it's dangerous territory. There are a lot of groups that are working in that territory. I think we might be best off, you know, highlighting those groups that are doing that full time, because there's a lot of groups that kind of do exactly that. I think they're sort of low quality groups, and there are high quality groups that are doing that. So that you know, again, our best role I think is is as a connector, and if that's not something we can, that, you, we could spend 120, 50 percent of our time just on uh, communication with consumers. Yes. Yeah. No. Absolutely. We have to think about how to deal with that. But you're right. This is mainly mainly right now in, in the in the research space. Anyway. I'm concerned about trying to get students into this area. Mm -hmm. and at the moment, you can get a PhD, you have to have a department. Yeah. Presumably, it's a research or a technology course. Is it possible to have a subcategory where there's a degree in epidemiology? So, you. Category of, uh, oh, my God, are you, you're a plant. You didn't have it, not a potted plant. You're, you're, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have started, so there's. Epidemiology has started a whole series of tracks, um, global health, life first epidemiology, chronic disease, and meta-research is one of those. So we're still developing the curriculum, um, but that's one of the tracks. So by next year, you will be able to get a degree in, in uh, epidemiology, and John and I will be leading that track or concentration um, it, it, with a you know concentration in meta-research. Yeah. Meta-research is broader than the meta it is so you know this will be those it those be folks nice to have some liaison with nature department. well we could do it with statistics absolutely so every one of these concentrations involves uh li liaising with faculty and other in other departments because very few of the concentrations we have all the expertise within mm -hmm. that department so we'll certainly want it i mean we'll be using the faculty russ will be uh working on it you know we can use courses from anywhere in the university. Is the point. So you, it's a great suggestion, and, and that's actually one of the things we, we want to deliver. I think we're right at one. Um, we're going to have so these uh, seminars with really a, a spectacular group of invited uh, faculty. Really, all the best people we could think of are going to be coming on a what bi-weekly basis from now until uh, the end, almost to the end of the year. They'll be streamed. They'll be, are we recording them too? They're being streamed, they're being recorded, so watch out for them and watch out for the meetings. And again, if you want to come to the meeting uh, in two weeks, please, please, please do. And uh, thanks for coming. It's great to see you.
Oh, but I'm going to be on so much. 